Uh, good morning and welcome to Brady Ware's third annual uh, Take Five Leadership uh, Nonprofit Leadership Conference. Uh, just uh, my name is Bob Reynolds. Uh, I'm a partner at, at Brady Ware, uh, and I have the responsibility for overseeing our nonprofit service group. Uh, many of you might be wondering why Take Five. Uh, when we were kicking this idea around a few years ago about hosting some type of annual conference for nonprofit organizations in the region, uh, we kept circling around what we're asking all of you to do is to take five and step away from the day to day. Let's have a conversation to talk about things that are more long term in nature, more strategic in nature, uh, and that was really the idea with which we move forward with this conference. So, uh, before I introduce Derek, if you were born after 1980, stand up. <coughs> How many people watch Dr. Phil? He always says it's not about you. <laughs> well, the good news is today is all about you. Today we're going to talk about uh, millennials and how do we engage millennials as volunteers, donors, future leaders of our organizations. Uh, and here to lead us in a discussion on that topic uh, is Derek Feldman. And if you'll pardon me, I'm going to read his bio. Uh, Derek is a sought after speaker, researcher, and advisor in cause engagement. He founded Achieve to help organizations address their most pressing issues through research and data-driven, strategically designed fundraising and awareness campaigns. Derek is the lead researcher and creator of the Millennial Impact Project, a multi-year study of how the next generation supports causes. This ongoing study has been cited in hundreds of publications, including Forbes, Time, Fast Company, and the Chronicle of Philanthropy, the Wall Street Journal, and the New York Times. Through, the, uh, through this research, as well as his role at Achieve, Derek has worked with companies and organizations such as AT&T, Facebook, BMW, PBS, and the Cause Foundation to understand how the next generation of donors, activists, and employees are redefining the work, cause work. He is the founder of MCON. All right, I can read. Um, the nation's premier conference on millennials and social good, which draws speakers from foreign nonprofit organizations across the world. MCOM explores the question of whether and how organizations are taking advantage of today's heightened interest in causes to better serve their constituents. Derek is co author of the book Cause for Change The Why and How of Nonprofit Millennial Engagement. And he is authoring the upcoming social movements for good, how companies and causes create vital change, which will be available in March of 2016. He is a regular contributor to the Philanthropy News Digest and the Huffington Post uh, Impact Channel. Derek is on the leadership faculty of the Points of Light Corporate Institute and a guest lecturer for the School of Public and Environmental Affairs at Indiana University. Derek received an undergraduate degree from Southeast Missouri State, and his graduate degree is from the Lilly School Family School of Philanthropy at Indiana University. He went uh, on to lead national fundraising efforts for the League and the Learning to Give before founding Achieve in 2008. So please join me in welcoming Derek. Don't you love bios, right? <laughs> so how many of you, your parents, know what you do? <laughs> yeah. So I had the chance, my dad said to me, for some reason my parents think I work in the CIA. I have no idea why. <laughs> so I said, Dad, you know what would be really great is why don't you come to one of these speaking engagements that I have? And you could hear all about the research that we do and, and so on. And he's like, great. And so somebody just, like, um, j just went through my bio here. And, and then at the end, I said, Dad, do you, know what I, do you know what I do? 
And he goes, no. He said, how come they only talked about all the good things that you did in life? And I'm like, well, what do you mean? And he goes, well, you know that time when you, you know, threw eggs at your sister, had the party in high school? Nobody talks about those bad things, right, in bios. And I'm like, that's true. And I said, well, do you now know what I do? And he goes, no, I rewrote your bio. And it had like all the bad things <laughs> in it for the course of my time. Um, so thank you for being here. We're going to go through today what we've learned. So I, we started this journey in 2009 to try and figure out, actually at the time the word millennial was never even used. It's actually only a term that's been used in the last four or five years. Ish. And so in 2009, we got started with trying to understand why and how people do what they do with causes. We're a research company, essentially. So Steve and Jean Case, have you ever heard of them? Anybody? How about AOL, America Online? You know, you've got mail. They're the ones that founded that. So they came to us at that time and they said, um, there's this group of population of people born after 1980 who we'll call social citizens at this time. That's, that's the term that was being used. Can you go out and figure out why they're doing what they're doing for good? I'm like, really? And I said, all right. So we sat down and and uh, uh, we've been going through these studies, 50,000 people later, now we're six or seven years into the project, and I have to tell you is that we're still learning. Because if you're doing research on a demographic that's currently going through so much change, you find yourself as a researcher to constantly come out with corrections which the media is great to tell me about the last time I made a correction, of course. So as we go through this, there's a couple things I want you to realize. First and foremost, that how many of you are, have uh, employees in this demographic? Children in this demographic? All right. There's an old saying is, is that um, you are probably an outlier if you only think that the one or two people constantly persuade your decision making. Um, and it's very true in this. Unfortunately, what we have today is your experience that might happen with your children or your employees, and immediately we begin to think everybody's like that as well, right? And guess who really helps to do that? The media. The media. We have boomers in here, right? Mm -hmm. I hate to tell you this, boomers. Think about it for a minute, what your parents said about you and your involvement. Everybody thought, by the way, that you were the first narcissistic generation, which was very interesting. This is from Life magazine in 1968, talking about the generation gap that exists. We're the greatest generation. We're all interviewed in this, this piece, this periodical, to talk about the lack of civic involvement they're seeing with boomers at the time, and that they weren't going to be like them as well. Don't worry, the first time the me generation was actually used, Xers, you thought that you, we all loved you too. We thought you were narcissistic as well. And in fact, that was the first time that we started to talk about the me decade. That kind of seems familiar to what Time Magazine likes to put out there. This is Time Magazine's generational coverage every single year. If you work for Time Magazine, it's likely that you'll cover this topic in some way or form. What's also interesting is that they forget that there's a Wayback Machine, that there's this thing called the internet that we could see covers. So the me topic here is the same one that they talked about in X. And in fact, our research team took the same articles and both the words me were the most used name, our, our, our a word throughout all of them. So what does this tend to tell us? The media loves this topic. And when you hear about it, we immediately go to this sense of they're right. They're absolutely right. Time Magazine will always talk about one particular study that happens. This study measures narcissism right in a, in a person's time frame in their life. This is the time they do this study, two months after you graduate from college. How many of you were a little focused on yourself two months after college? Right. And in fact, in the 2013 article, they say this is the worst narcissism we've ever seen. They said that same headline in 1986 as well as in 2009. So here's what we got to know. Before we go into today, a couple things. One is I need you to suspend what you might have heard in the media about how bad things are. And we need to also suspend your ex current, current experiences because there's 80 million in this population of those after 1980. And it doesn't necessarily mean that all 80 million act that same way. And all boomers don't act the same way. And all Xers don't act the same way as well. Now, there are some tendencies that we're going to talk about. And we'll get through each one of those. 
but I just ask just for an hour to suspend anything that you've heard of. Sound good? All right. So let's go ahead and get started with the first question I want to ask you all. Do you believe that millennials are thoughtful in their giving or thoughtless in their giving? Who wants to say thoughtful? Raise your hand. Who says thoughtless? Who's nervous? <laughs> all right. It's very interesting. So the first time that Gene and Steve, after they, they said to us, uh, I've been a year into the studies, they said, Derek, we're going to bring you to DC, nice lunch, and we want you to tell us exactly what you're finding. So we sit down with them, and uh, I said, we've got some good stuff already. I'm like, oh, we've been excited to hear it. I'm like, all right. So we sit down, and they said, what do you know so far? And I said, well, here's the thing. Millennials are just like every other human being. They have empathy inside of them, like we all do. And guess what? We act for causes thoughtlessly all of the time. So Gene looks at Steve and says, I think we need to get the money back because this is a really bad research study. <laughs> but it's true. It's true. You have to remember the general population. All of us are very empathetic. When we see another person who is in pain or in hurt, we immediately, immediately try to help, right? This is natural disaster giving. This is all the things that actually happen. How many of you will probably give to one of those bell ringers this fall coming up? Yeah. So we do a couple things in that one, right? How many of you went up to the Salvation Army person and said, can I see the 990? Yeah. No one, right? Or when you're in the cause checkout lane and somebody says, will you donate a dollar? And you're like, I need to make sure that this nonprofit is going through all of the right things to make sure that it happens. Now, of course, I know this is Brady Ware's conference, so I have to help them a little bit too, is that the vast majority of the public acts very thoughtlessly in this space. Now, fundraisers and marketers, it's their goal to take this thoughtless behavior, these actions that constantly happen, and move them to become better and bigger donors, right? That's our job, essentially, as, as fundraisers and marketers. But to say that every single person will give every time and every moment thoughtfully goes against the actual behavior we have within us. And millennials are very thoughtless in their giving right now. But they'll move to thoughtful, and we'll talk about when that happens. When we see this thoughtless or thoughtful behavior, there's a couple things that make the behavior happen that we've started to notice. And we're going to go through four of those, OK? So here's the first thing. We'll call these millennial cause motivators. The first one is consumer behavior. Consumer behavior. How much do millennials spend a year on consumer discretionary goods? Does anybody know? This is where you throw out big number, and then we kind of see. How much? Three billion? It's 300 billion, but close. Let's multiply that, right? So now, this is what gets us as parents a little nervous, right? Because that 300 billion is technically not all owned by millennials, as we know. All right, this is where some of that debt comes in and, and so forth. What's really interesting, though, out of the 300 billion, 16 billion of it comes into our field nationwide. And guess what? That is on par for every other generation based on inflation and everything else. So do millennials give or not give? The answer is they give very similarly. Yeah? When you say the 16 billion comes into our field, does that mean the nonprofit? The nonprofit sector. That's right. That's right. So of that 16 billion, it's coming into charity in some way. Now we're going to talk about where a lot of it comes into, which may or may not be the method or process that we want. But in fact, if you look at the total amount of money, it's very, very on par. Now, there might be a little statistical difference, like a 1.5%. But essentially, we're right in fact with where other demographics have been. What's interesting about consumer behavior is, is that if you want a product right now, honestly, if you want something, we can all get it. We have devices, and we have technology, and we have all these things to happen. Does anybody know the year that Amazon introduced one-click payment? 2009. Do we have one-click donation in our field? No. If you want to get this product and go to the store or have it delivered, I can have that happen. If I want to go volunteer for your organization, I have to spend eight hours prior to getting there to be trained to go have it happen. If I want to sign up for, or do a monthly program where I can have this product sent to my house, I can do it quickly and easily. If I want to sign up for monthly donations for your nonprofit, it's going to take me three to four different web pages to even get into that system to be considered. 
we have a disconnect between consumer behavior and nonprofit behavior. And here is the challenge with all of that. In a consumer behavior side, you receive the good, right? So if you want it, you get it, no matter how old you are. In the nonprofit space, I don't personally get it. Somebody else does. Right? So if, if I am moved in this moment to do something, I don't necessarily get the benefit immediately. Now, some will say, well, you get a tax benefit and all those things, but we're going to move to thoughtless first behavior. And when we look at that, somebody else has to benefit. And so you lose the impulsive nature. We get our attention spans, regardless of demographic, just sort of changes as we go through. We get tired and we, we move on. So at the beginning of every year, we, will, um, we recruit panels of millennials, besides all the other different studies that we do. So we'll have about 500 millennials that will track nationwide their behavior, their actual behavior. And it's quite funny. Sometimes there are some interesting things that happen in the US that tend to spark stuff and doesn't. And at the beginning of the year, I'll tell you this, we ask one major question, and then we can't intervene ever again, because then it's bad research. So we ask, what do you plan to give to this year? And what do you think the answer is? Where do you think they want to give their dollars? Anyone want to take a guess? Church? Yes? Social services. Social services. What else? Kids. Kids. Actually, the answer is, number one, I want to help somebody in my local neighborhood where I live, work, and play. Secondly, I care about that somebody has some education, because by the way, they're the most educated generation ever. And third, it tends to be health-related in some way, shape, or form. And I'm going to include food in there as well. Then, at the end of the year, we look at everything they have. By the way, we have to get a hold of tax receipts and everything, and trying to get that sometimes is quite interesting for our team. And then we'll look at it, and guess what we see? None of that stuff. None of it. International cause here, and environmental over there, and all of this. So we sit them down, and we say, why are you such a liar? <laughs> no, it's bad. Um, so what we do is we say, we're curious. We're wondering why you gave to these causes. And what we hear is, well, that's Tommy's gig. That's Martha's thing. All of that. And I say, all right. And by the way, we have the answer from previous, right? So I'll say, why don't you tell me what you would like to give to? Same three answers. I would like to give to somebody in my local neighborhood. I would like it to be education related and health. So what sometimes people desire or intend to get don't necessarily follow through. And it doesn't mean that it's wrong. It means that our appetite and attention is very, very different. If you are wanting somebody, and if somebody is pulled so much to do something for good, and you can't capture it and, and get it going, they're going to move on. We, will, we have tracking cookies on our, on our panels. We watch and monitor the sites they go to. One minute they're on Amazon, and the next minute they're on the United, United Way site, and we're like, oh my gosh, what was it? And it was nothing. We'll, we'll question them. They'll be like, I don't know. It just came in my head, and I just went there, <laughs> right? It's, we're like, oh, wait, darn, right? We're going to get there. Okay. Good, good. You're, you're on track. So as we, as we start going through it, we notice is that we have impulses, and we have really good impulses when it comes to this space. First and foremost, boomers, it's to you that we have to give a lot of credit to. I don't know if you know this. This is the first generation that's been exposed to cause in the school than any other demographic ever. And guess what? That first experience is typically event-related, which is something we're going to talk about here in a minute. All right, the second one is around feedback. How many of you have posted something on Facebook ever? Ever, right? And how many of you never had anybody like it? <laughs> yeah, it's awkward, right? It's that awkward state of putting yourself out there and you're like, I just need to go back and delete that. Nobody likes it, right? <laughs> So that's, that whole platform, that whole thing, is based upon people talking back to you in a constant form. It would not exist if that thing had no communication back and forth as well. What's very interesting is, is that our field has a feedback mechanism. What is that? Does anybody know what our field has that we communicate back? Annual reports. Yeah. How many of you love them? You can't even just get enough of them. Yeah. <laughs> The vast majority of the pr practitioner field actually hates the annual report. But in no other field, by the way, do we allow a 12-month cycle of feedback to be appropriate. If we all went to the doctor today, gave them $40 for the copay, and the doctor said, thank you for paying me today, 
I'll give you your results in 12 months if you have cancer. You would throw up in arms. You would not like it. The first time I, I was at a college, I for some reason thought I was going to be a lawyer. I don't know why. And so I went to take the LSAT. And um, when I was going through the LSAT project or, or thing, they, you, know, you have to, you have to like fill it all out. And then you wait patiently for the mail for it to come. Right? Every day, you want to be that person that gets the envelope. Um, then my mom got it the one day I was in, and she's like, I opened it. And she's like, you may not want to be a lawyer, because it did not go well. So I ended up being, uh, my sister was the lawyer. She kind of got, you know, so, um, so I ended up taking the GRE. And when I took the GRE, I was sitting there, and if anybody's ever taken the GRE to go into grad school, you take it in front of a computer, and then they, at the end, and you can pace yourself. This is like the best social experiment ever. You, you pace yourself and you watch, you can tell when everybody gets to the end. Because on the screen it says, you can get your answer right now of how well you did. So everybody's like, oh boy. You know, people are like stressing, you know, you can tell there's a little nervousness. And then we click it, you're like, okay. You know, life's going to be okay. We're going to be all right. That instantaneous feedback has happened consistently. I could check out TripAdvisor before I got here. So when we automatically, by the way, hear feedback in our employment spaces, our workplaces, we're like, they always want to figure out what's going on. Well, in every aspect of our society, we've moved that way. Not because we're not interested in transparency, but because we have the tools and resources to do it. And especially in our field, too, as well. This is generosity water. Generosity Water doesn't take a 12-month feedback loop. What they say is as soon as you give us a donation, we're going to create seven points of contact. Seven points of contact between us and you. Derek, thanks so much for the donation. Two weeks later, now Derek, thanks again for the donation. We're identifying the village. We'll be back in touch when we get there. Three weeks later, Derek, this is what we're on track. What we've noticed is, is that, um, and these are bad research, if you see a research study out there that says donors care about the impact, yes, true, however, they still do thoughtless things without the impact, right? How many of you gave at the checkout line or did something with the Salvation Army or did any of those things, right, as well? In fact, I, I wrote an article once that said I think impact lost its impact in some way because to essentially we've come to a place where we, we kind of just should have it as well. But with millennials, it was interesting. We discovered two years ago that it wasn't necessarily the end product that they actually cared about. The fact that the $20 got to somebody in Africa, although they did, they cared more about the process, that you were actually doing something with an asset that they had given. We have to remember that every person has assets to give, right? We have assets of time. We have assets of skill. We have all these different kinds of things. And when somebody gives you something, they want to know that you're using it. Not necessarily waiting till it's done, but that you're using it. And in fact, we noticed that if a millennial hadn't been communicated to, within 30 days post-gift, retention starts to go down the tubes immediately. Now some will say, well, that's, that's crazy. We can't show an impact in 30 days. We don't want that necessarily. What we do want to know is that, hey, we gave you something. You're doing something with it. Just communicate during the process as well. By the way, you'll also find that that works fairly well in the workplace, too. The third one, around blending. We did start to notice with all of our panels, in this last couple years, we've shifted a little focus as well to look at the workplace. It's hard to ignore what's happening in the workplace. Any workplace today that doesn't have some sort of cause-related piece would be very difficult uh, to have happen. So it's interesting in all of our qualitative interviews, about every year we'll do about 2,500 to 3,000 hours of interviews as we'll go through. And during the interviews, it's always this, this sort of arc of questions that lead us to the end. Our, our head of research, we call this the moment, <laughs> where we'll start talking to an individual and say to them, well, why don't you tell us what you like to do for good or, or what you like to do to help somebody? Um, we never say, tell us about your involvement in the nonprofit sector. It doesn't test well. It just doesn't. Um, so when we start talking about it, they're like, well, I just like to do this. And they kind of go through there. And then we say, well, why do you like to do that? And usually it comes out of two to three things. One is, is my family was always active. Not necessarily that my family taught me, but that my family was active and I was exposed to it. It's modeling behavior. That's what they, that's what they get. 
The second one is, is that we'll often see is that I participated in something very young that shifted my mentality towards somebody else. Whether that was in school, whether that was raising money for the Muscular Dystrophy Association, or doing some cancer society, run, race, walk, whatever it was, they started to realize that the world was much different than just by themselves. And sometimes at the end too, we'll get to where they'll say, you know, I just constantly believe that we need to ha live in this environment where everybody is supportive. Those are the kind of three strands that we'll hear. And then after that, they'll, we'll often say to them, okay, great, well tell us about what you do for a living. And they'll be like, well, I work at Starbucks, or I do this. I'm like, okay, and then we pause, and this is what happens. You know, I don't think I should be working at Starbucks. <laughs> We're like, uh-oh. So this is the interviewer starting to change their mentality of where they go, right? And so we go through all of these things, and we, they start to talk about personal values, and then professional values. They start using words like cause and purpose, and all of these things. And then at the end, they'll say, I, wanna ha I just want to make sure what I do benefits somebody in some way. We, um, we have research partners from companies to causes, and one of them is CSX, the transportation company. Probably not the most exciting company for all of us to come out of college and work for, versus maybe Google or the rest. And by the way, Google's a research partner too. And in, in CSX, with the most exciting thing that we'll see is that an employee comes to us and they'll say, and in fact, by the way, in this space, their millennial employees rank higher than in Google or any other technology company we've had. The reason why is because everything that that company does is transporting things from cities to cities to help people in certain ways. So we can do good without necessarily being in a for-profit space uh, or in a non-profit space as well, which also means that we've widened the net. And when you see or hear, well, the reason why that person bought the Tom's shoes is because it was doing good, that had a factor in some part of the decision. But also, we have to remember that's also part of pop culture, too, as well. All right, so the fourth one is around assets. Everybody has an asset to give. Assets of time, assets of skill, asset of their network, and asset of their money. Now here is what drives fundraisers crazy, because the millennial will value each one of those equivocally. So what that means is, is that if I give you time, it's as if I gave you 50. Or if I gave you five, it's as if I give you 50,000. By the way, we see this habit starting to form not just with millennials, although it's heightened, also with other demographics too as well. So what we have seen is, is that more organizations doing what we call a learn, act, give model where they try to get the individual to understand something sharply and quickly, act in some way, and then from that action, then give and donate. How many of you have ever, how many of you have ever signed a petition? Yeah. Now, why did you do it? Anybody share the reason why they did it? Anybody? What's that? Believes in that. Exactly. Believed in the cause is one of the most, in, is one of the most uh, high rated pieces that we'll hear. The second thing is, is that because I wanted to tell everybody else I believed in the cause as well. So remember we have those 500, right? So Melissa, my research assistant, uh, comes in and she says, Derek, I think we've got a big thing in research today. And I'm like, oh, this is what gets us excited, right? <laughs> so I said, what is it, Melissa? And um, she says, we had 30 of our, of our panelists sign a petition. And when you have 30 out of a random sample of 500 people, that's significant. If it's randomly done all at the same time. So unfortunately, what we have to do in that case is that we pull those people out and we can't use them again because we're intervening, right? We've lost the flow of it. So we're like, all right, it's big enough, let's figure out. And what they did is that they signed a petition that said, if you sign here, world hunger ends tomorrow. So we're like, all right. So Melissa says, do you think? And I'm like, what I'm thinking? She said, yeah. Like, they think world hunger is ending tomorrow. <laughs> I'm like, mm, I doubt it. But let's figure it out. So what we did is we pulled them all out. And I said, we sat them down. I said, do you believe that world hunger ends tomorrow because you signed this? And the answer was no. By the way, they said, it's going to take years for that thing to get solved. <laughs> True. And I said, well, why did you do it? I just believe people should have food. And I think I wanted to, I just wanted to tell other people about it as well. I just wanted to exude the action of it. A lot of us act 
we all act for causes because there's something in us that says when we act, we get closer to it. How many of you do direct mail? All right. Don't you love direct mail? Um, uh, I'm actually not a fan of direct mail, but it's one of the best and most transactionary uses in our field. It actually has the highest giving rates and responses than any other technology that ever exists so far. Um, what's interesting about direct mail is I always like the people who will say, well, Derek, we spent hours crafting this direct mail. Crafting it. <coughs> Board members have rewritten it. We have done as much. This is going to raise money like you had never seen. And then all of a sudden they get a half of a percent to a 1% response rate. Why is that? Well, the vast majority of the public doesn't necessarily read that thing. I hate to tell you. The vast majority of the public skims it. We skim, and in fact, there's video behavioral analysis where we can watch a person skimming it, going to the PS first, flipping it back over and being like, I'm giving. What's also false to understand around behavior is just because somebody transacts a way doesn't mean that they actually will use that way consistently at all. And so in the act of doing something, what we notice is that people act for causes because it gets them closer to what they believe in more than anything else. When you send a direct mail to somebody who's never acted for that issue, you're going to get a half to a one and a half response rate. When you start helping people act or do something for the issue that you address prior to asking them to give, you'll start to see higher response rates because we're getting closer to it. We notice that some campaigns that, that we follow is, is they'll use this quick model of saying, here's what you got to learn quickly, here's how you can take an action, and then two weeks later, here's a solicitation. Seven to nine percent response rates are even higher from their retentions even better. Us as humans need to constantly act to reinforce our commitment to the issue that you address. If you're always sending a solicitation, the solicitation is one form of action, it isn't the complete spectrum in general. We'll see here, this is water.org. They'll do campaigns where they say, today we need you to donate your voice. What do you think's followed up in three weeks later? Today we need you to donate an hour. Today we need you to donate this. Now we need you to give. They look at it from fully. They'll map out their full year. We sat down with our marketing team. They'll map out the full year and say, these are our campaigns. This one is about volunteerism campaign. This is about skill. This one is about giving. They map out the true assets of the individual. And guess what? They also track what those individuals give to on an annual basis, not just with money. And when they see that a person hasn't acted enough, they go at them with, want something like this. Now it's time for you to act or give that of your time or something else. So they can balance all against each other. Social media. We love social media to a certain extent as well. And everybody that will um, sort of come to our stuff, you'll notice that we barely talk about social media. Social media is a tool for social engagement. But there was something that was starting to happen that we noticed as well. Um, there's a gentleman who is a lead researcher at Facebook. His name is Paul Adams. He's now moved on. But at the time, we corroborated with him a little bit to try and figure out what he sees in Facebook and how that compares to what we see in, in other worlds with our panels. So when you look at Facebook in general, a lot of us have a lot of friends, kind of, right? That's that high school friend that said, hey, do you want to reconnect? And you're like, ugh, maybe. <laughs> and then, then you do it. Well, guess what? The algorithm and how Facebook is devised, you'll never even really hear from them. So it's OK if you do it, because this is how it works. Essentially, we've got concentric circles in Facebook and in our society that are in and around each of us. Now, we have maybe 1,300 to 5,000 friends. I'll just make this up. But Facebook, what they do is that there's this thing behind the scenes that says, I'm only going to show you the people that you talk to and they communicate back to. This is the feedback part, right? So if you don't really talk to them, guess what? No worries. We got you. We're going to keep you safe. We're just going to put them on the outlier. And when nobody else is posting stuff, we'll randomly put something in there for you. And if you're ever wondering why nobody in your Facebook community for your organization does anything, this is why. is because when they sign up to like you in that impulsive moment and you, they don't communicate back to you, you get shoved to the outside as well. So what ends up happening, though, is when we were talking with Paul, is that in our inner circle and even in Facebook, you will always have four to six people that will constantly come up in your feed all of the time. 
Those are the same people that you communicate with. And guess what we discovered? Four to six people were the average amount of people that got a millennial to do peer engagement in something, especially with causes to donate. Whether it was Mary or Tom or all those others, it was the same four to six. And guess what one of those units was? Family it was also in there. So what we notice is that in our society and social engagement is, especially with millennials, is that it will be a small group of people, four to six individuals, that will heighten our participation in anything. And all of the filtering that you would normally do, you goes out the window, <laughs> right? This is, should I do this? And somebody says, you should. This is that bad friend of yours, right? You should completely do that. That's great. You do it. <laughs> because they're in the four to six. Versus saying, well, if they were out here and that high school friend told you that you never really liked and said, I think you should do this, you're like, hmm, doubt it. Even if it was the best idea. And it probably could save you lots of money or whatever it was. And so when we track participation in social engagement, it is true that almost a lot of that 16 billion comes from four to six friends of every single donor. A lot of it does. Not that we like it, but that's exactly what's happening. Now, what's even worse about that is everybody will talk about our retention issues that exist. Yes, they do not retain in that system because these four to six people are not charged with stewardship. <laughs> We're not charging me with if I brought in four to six people by saying, all right, Derek, now that you brought them in, we need you to help them like us even more. No, my goal was to raise money for you. My goal was to bring my friends to go do volunteerism. The reason why we didn't retain is because the organization didn't have a system to take them from interest and enthusiasm to even further in action. So as we look at social engagement, you need to use that appropriately and know that, yes, a lot of millennials will bring in friends. And they'll bring in those same four, four to six people. But a lot of that attitude is not necessarily directed towards you. Don't confuse their action for you as they're deeply in love with you. I know that we like to do that. Um, it's always funny when I, uh, I'll go uh, talk to a board and they'll say, Derek, we have 5,000 Facebook followers. How come they don't have 5,000 donors? I'm like, well, that's not how that works. <laughs> and let me explain how this all happens. And the other thing is, is that just because they show and raised their hand at one point and said, I might be interested in you, we immediately are like, they love us. Absolutely love us. Now you're going to be our best donor. You're going to attend every event and you're going to volunteer 900 hours this year. And none of that happens, of course. All right, the next one is around actions. I talked about actions are commitments to causes, but we move from a certain couple things. Some of the most successful campaigns that draw millennials in allow, and this is gonna, this is gonna hurt, allow them to self-organize around the issue with pretty much zero guidelines. And does it ever go sideways? 99% of the time it never does. What they do is, is that you'll see um, is that from, from what you're doing right now, I suspect, is a lot of PR type messaging out in the community, right? So this would be, uh, we need you, Derek. This is called direct response. Derek, we need you to give. Here, respond to this. It's like a B to C each time, each time. Derek, we need you to volunteer. Sign up to volunteer right now. But at some point, your cause is never going to go bigger unless you allow people to self-organize around it. Somebody has to take your issue and say, ah, I believe in it, and now I want to bring others around it how I like to. If you are always going to be the guiding post for everything, you will never get the mass quantity as well. Um, we were talking earlier, the, the book that I have coming out in March talks about how social movements were created especially in today's environment. Uh, what we did is we interviewed all of the leaders of the last five years of the social movements, and then we interviewed 25 random people that's participated in those movements. And guess what? Not the same vision of what happened between the two. What did happen, though, is that at some point, the founder was so controlling, and then they realized, I can't control it anymore. And I got to let it go. And the only way I let it go is if I allow them to self-organize around it, allow them to do things for the issue, and then they'll make it their own. Liberty in North Korea, an organization I'll show some campaign stuff uh, this afternoon if we get there, is they, what they do is they even allow, they give them as many resources as they can. They pair them up with people who have done things, and they say, you're off to the races. And we'll give you as much support as you could ever need. 
So you'll have to create a moment where you say, if you like us and you're supportive of everything that we have, that at some point you can take it to the next level by organizing yourself, by doing it that way. If we don't do that, you're going to be stuck in always queuing things. And then you're going to wrestle with this big question, which is, how much time do I spend with millennials versus boomers? Major donors, minor donors. At some point, we're all donors. We're all people. And it's our interest that you should designate your time against. If you have somebody, regardless of age, that's interested at this level, what are you going to do for anybody? at that level to get here. And then, when people get to this certain point, whether you're a boomer or a millennial, you'll say, you know what, this is what you, we can give to you to self-organize and get people around it as well. The third one is around solutions. How many of you can track what a dollar a day does? <laughs> Tough. Does anybody know the first time where we used that tangibility? A dollar a day, or a dollar, remember Sally Struthers? For just a cup of coffee a day. That was the first time. Um, does anybody know the next time that we used a tangible solution? Tangible meaning like $10 does this. American Idol in 2002 did a Sweats for Nets campaign. You could buy a $10 net for somebody in Africa to save them in malaria. That was the second largest, besides the Sally Struthers one that happened 40 or 50 years ago, all based upon the same tactic of tangibility. If we can tangibly talk about the inequality that exists between somebody over there Heighten the emotion, reaction from the public. That's how the secret sauce works. So in here, what we notice is, is that millennials like to be for something going forward. How many of you will start that direct mail appeal this year with, as I reflect on the last year? <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, good memory. <laughs> Nobody, that, I can't get behind things you did 10 months ago. What I can get behind is what's right in front of me that I can tackle and be a part of. Why does millennial messaging in that area work more? Well, because it's easy to be part of a movement going forward and it has legs to it than saying something, well, you're going for the donor in that statement that's going to spend time looking past that and doing an evaluative process in direct mail and say, all of these organizations, this is the one that did the best work. And you're removing the emotion from that individual in that one instance. And then that's why you get a half to one and a half. This right here. It's from the Girl Effect. Does anybody know them? It's an interesting organization. They do girls empowerment. Actually funded completely by the Nike Foundation, but you would never know that because the Nike Foundation did something very noble, is that they only have it on the bottom of one small thing that says, this is what we support. We just believe in this issue. They've been at this issue for actually 10 years. This is not just because it's maybe a popular issue now. Um, they, uh, this piece, the, this is the moment to make girls impossible to ignore, are you in? How could you say no, right? You have to help people be and use participatory language to be a part of something going forward. Um, we'll see, we'll do A, B tests where we'll send a solicitation that says, hi, 100% of your donation will go here. Or 80% um, of the population that we affect will be better than the other one. 60% of the people, 10%, we run really well all of those things. And then all of a sudden solicitation comes out like this. This is the issue. This is what's going on. Are you with us or not? The best part, and I don't have it here, but they had a home page that said, do you believe the world needs a kick in the pants? Yes or no? And when you clicked no, it went to a page that said, we're not for you. <laughs> right? How many of your boards would pass that? <laughs> exactly. But here's the thing with it. Millennials attach to belief statements. They don't attach to institutions. Your institution is a wonderful institution. It's got a great brand name, maybe. It's got a great underlying message. And it does incredible work. It does. But I have never in the years that we have been interviewing or had all these people go through our studies, does somebody say, I am a donor to the United Way because, or I'm a donor to your nonprofit because. What we hear first is, I believe every kid should have food, or I believe that all of these things, and that's why I support these organizations. The entity is secondary to the broader issue of what's going on. The other thing is, is that 
no one will fault a person for believing in something like that. And so when you use language that says, believe or do work with us because of all of these statistical reasons, you're not attaching to the belief overall of what they have. One of the best campaigns that we tested for a client it came out there and it, and it said, if you believe that tomorrow morning this child has to have breakfast just like you, you, need, you should be a part of us. That kind of statement versus saying we empower people, we educate people, and we invest in innovative technology something something. By the way, you should know that there are four words that underperform each time. Are you ready? This will be good. See if you used them this morning. Community, <laughs> impact, empower, and sustainable. I love those words. I know exactly what they mean, and everybody probably in here can get an idea of what they mean. But the vast majority of the general population out there is not like us. They're not as smart as you are when it comes to this space. <coughs> I have not, in the years that we've been doing interviews, heard any millennial having a sustainability party on a Friday night. <laughs> having those kinds, but we bring it in, right? We're like, oh, we need to talk about how sustainable we are because that's top of mind and it's really not. What's interesting, by the way, if you're ever interested in a study that talks about charity ratings, um, there's four or five of us research companies that are in a consortium and one company did one of the best studies. They tested whether or not the charity rating would work, right, in donor behavior. And of course it worked with major donors who make institutional type decisions and of course it worked for some that were up there. But here's an interesting thing, how many of you have ever eaten at a restaurant and went before that and studied and analyzed what grade level they got in the last health inspection. It's quite interesting what you would maybe change your behavior if you did. It's the same thing. You don't go into a restaurant and be like, before we sit down I need to say what grade level you've gotten for the health inspection. We don't do that. But if you knew the entity had a B grade, you wouldn't go. You really, you would, so what was interesting is, is that this, this other research group that we know, they sent out a solicitation that said, you know, it was like, kind of like emotional and it had whatever. And the second one said, we got a B rating. Donations dropped. It wasn't until it was put in there <laughs> that we made the public understand what was trying to happen. And nobody wants to be a part of a B rating, right? We got to be A's as well. And so for a lot of us, we just don't see that space. We just don't see that as our opportunity to initially get involved. Now, however, thoughtful giving, if you're a good fundraiser, you'll bring those thoughtless actions to become more thoughtful. So as I mentioned, the tangible piece, right? A dollar equals this, all of these kinds of things. What is interesting is that our population right now, millennial or boomer, believes every dollar in our field should go completely into the program. It's true. And but here's what's also fascinating about this, is, is that even though that may be true, we still act emotionally to it as well. Um, we, uh, one of our research partners, again, Melissa, who always finds these kinds of things on our team, she, we, uh, when I say research partner, these are national causes that allow us to come in and be a part of strategy sessions. And then what we, uh, what we do is we look at the actual transaction behavior and then we interview donors. So we have to get the full circle of what happens. So Melissa comes into my office again and says, um, I think we caught one of our research partners lying. And I was like, oh, this is really good, <laughs> right? So I said, what is it? And she said, well, in this solicitation, I don't know how she remembered this, but she keeps track of everything. She said, in this solicitation, it said 100% of the gift that you give today will go to the people, whatever it was. She said, but I have the copy from three months ago that doesn't talk anything about that. And it doesn't mention it. And quite honestly, they brought up a little bit of the overhead stuff in the solicitation. She's like, well, let's call them up. Like, this is a gotcha moment, right? We're ready. So I called Justin up and I said, Justin, um, I have a question about this solicitation. And he said, yeah, that's exactly true. Anybody that gives through that solicitation, 100% goes to the people. And I said, well, how, but, you're lying, you know, this is the other. He goes, no, we're not. That other one, we took overhead out of. I'm like, hmm, creative. And I said, well, who underwrote, or well, how did you get it? He said, well, we have major donors that underwrite the overhead for that solicitation. So basically, anybody that gave through that one, we, our, we went back to our donors and our major donors as a match and gave all that money. They, they gave the money for the overhead per gift. And I was like, huh, fairly creative, sneaky. And then we went back to their donors, and guess what their donors said? 
I love the fact that 100% of my gift, my first gift, would go to them. And then we said, well, OK, um, what if not every gift couldn't go? Like, oh, no, that makes sense. But I was just happy that I could get this one to go. So donor behavior is kind of interesting. Initially, we, because of our perception, we want everything to be great and that every person we help is going to immediately get there at some point. And so we need to position things sometimes that way. But yet, education, over time, helps the donor move away from the thoughtless act to the more thoughtful. And so on the dollar saves a life, yes. Part of that is, this, um, and we called malaria no more and said, how is it physically possible that one dollar does a vaccine? What they do is they buy it in quantities of like hundreds of thousands, and then it's like 98 cents at the end. So it is true. By the way, they didn't raise as much money with this campaign, because when we went out to look at donor behavior, donors perceived that to be unbelievable, that one dollar could. So you can almost go to the opposite end of the spectrum. All right, which kind of leads us to a couple things I want to mention before we get to your questions. We have been looking at the space of the workplace, right? We're trying to understand where cause is most important. And what we continue to find out is, is that on our own, the general population, although we would say that we're cause enthusiasts, we're not big cause activists yet. And we constantly need to be prodded or prompt in some way. When we were looking at um, whether or not somebody works for a corporation just because of their cause-related or workplace stuff, we started to notice something. That in the beginning, every millennial was like everybody else. The two things they cared about in employment, salary and benefits. <laughs> it's true. Now, what was interesting, though, is that when somebody had the chance to take one or two positions and look at them equally, it's when, that's when the cause stuff started to really matter. And in fact, when the hiring agent interviewed them, it started to spike really heavily, where that individual introduced them to the cause space. So what that tells us is this, is that a vast majority of the public has this cause enthusiasm in us. We do. We do thoughtless behavior that leads us to thoughtful behavior over time, and then essentially gives us to a space where we're constantly doing more actions and we're organizing around our issue. That's the life cycle of bringing somebody from not knowing us to staying with us and being with us long term. If your organization is completely focused on the giving space of this, of this equation, millennials are not for you. It really isn't. Because they don't view it in that, in that standpoint, right? They're doing this because they want to take all assets for the issue that they care about. They want to self-organize around the issue. They're looking for you to provide feedback onto what's going on, not necessarily what the end outcome is. And they hope that you value the things that they value, whatever they would give to you in some way, shape, or form. One of the, one of the challenges that we've seen, initially when I sat down with Steve and Jean uh, Case in 2009, I asked them, why are you doing this? And they said, we'll tell you at some point, but not yet, right? You got to love that. <laughs> um, so we sit down about two years ago at lunch and again, and I said, so I have to ask you again. I asked you in 2009 why you were doing this. And you said, you'll tell me, so can, we, can, we, can you tell me? And she said, yeah. She goes, you know, I suspect that we're, you would think we're doing this because we think a millennial is you know, so important in this equation. She said, we don't. We actually believe all demographics are equally important and institutions are very important. Unfortunately, we've got the public and we've got our nonprofits. And not every time are we, are we kind of going there. And, and in fact, over the years, as we've professionalized, we've internalized more and more of what we do externally than ever before. And that's the stuff that a millennial wants to do. Boomers, if you had the things that a millennial has today to do good, you would be amazing. You were amazing then, you could be even more amazing if you had those tools as well in the social good space. So we can't confuse the tool with the behavior. Because the behavior is, just like boomers or anybody else, is that we want to do good. Unfortunately today though, is that I can do good without you. Quite honestly, if we want to give to cancer today, we don't have to do it through American Cancer Society. How many of your friends are hurting and you immediately are going to their aid, right? Now, at Cancer Society, we want us to go through them and hopefully get to the end as well. But I have the tools and the technology to do it. We don't need anybody to do our work. We need donors to fund it, essentially. But we don't need anybody else. But that's not the mentality of a cause, right? That's not, that's not a movement-driven environment. 
So if you really want to capture millennial or general public population attention, you have to move away from saying, we can only do this and we'll ask the public to respond when we want them to respond to things. But yet say, you know what, we need the public to do all of this stuff with us and for us. And at the end of the day, institutions are necessary because you do have the most change on the individual that people fund than doing it themselves. Essentially the reason why we've all looked at this. So, and you should know that for every practitioner will say, Derek, do you know about this? I get emails from millennials too that will say, I have a good idea for you, Derek. What do you think about it? And then I email back and say, that sounds like Habitat for Humanity. You should go talk to them. <laughs> So as much as we've got this interest in cause enthusiasm, this cause expertise over here at the institution, and these challenges with demographics, we're still the population that moves from thoughtless to thoughtful behavior, and we need you to bring us along that path. Thanks. <laughs>